Welcome to Ride On, episode 14. I'm James Gross, and I'm joined by my co-host, Julia Thane. Julia, how are you doing today? Doing great, James. Doing great. How about yourself? Oh, man. I'm, I'm fantastic. I'm wonderful. All right, let's talk about some fun announcements we have real quick here. First is our winner of the Juiced Rip Current S. Uh, which has been uh, an amazing giveaway that we've been able to do over the last two weeks. Shout out to Juiced and to Tora Harris for coming on uh, on episode 12, the episode that Julie wasn't here. And based on your feedback, that was a tragedy. So we have to make sure it doesn't happen again. <laughs> um, but yeah, the drum roll for the Rip Current S winner goes to Madison Carter. Uh, so congratulations, Madison. Uh, you can send us an email at info at microrelay.io um, and we will get you that Rip Current S the next announcement I wanted to make, Julia, was we have another giveaway. This will be for the Prodigy from Ride One Up, and we'll have the founder of uh, Ride One Up on the show today to, to talk about the Prod Prodigy, which is one of their amazing vehicles, as well as uh, the Rift, which we, they just released, and the Rev One that they've um, more recently released. So we'll have the founder on today. Really cool story. Um, doing a lot of work. Ride One Up continues to kind of climb the leaderboard in sales, it appears. Um, so really excited to have um, Ride One Up on later today. And uh, yeah, that'll be part of the show. So that's all my housekeeping. Not going to talk about anything uh, microbilly Europe related or anything. Most of that news is at microbilly.io. Um, but yeah, shocked. that's it on my end. I'm shocked. Right, ready I for thought... you, Julia. Yeah, I thought Ride of a Lifetime at least would come up, but uh, you know what? We'll, we'll not talk about it. We won't talk about I it. I mean, I could tease some swag right now, but I'll try not to. Go. Wanna, <laughs> okay, wanna, sounds good. This is the lowest that. lowest number of announcements that we've ever had. However, I think these were some really high quality announcements, especially with another giveaway happening from Wide One Up. Um, so with Great. that said, James, on to the news. My first news story is about safety. So you might have to get your safety vest on here. Does it? Is That's it nearby? True. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I can't believe well, you have a heart attack. You're in by two. Oh man, wait. Right. There we go. We got to change up the safety prop, Julia. You thought I was going fast. Look at that. I've got you on your toes, I did. Julia. I did. I did. I did. It's almost like you're like a Lego character. Like there's like different really? pieces that you can add on. What's you next? Thought, yeah, like I train did. conductor? Yeah. I can't wait to tell the micro buddy crew. <laughs> Who thought I was pulling out the vest and then I came with the helmet. Sorry, continue oh, on, Julia. Yeah, we're going to have to talk about you. why you have that later. But in any case, uh, <laughs> now that I can't concentrate on the story that I was going to uh, mention about road safety. Um, the big news is that Qualcomm is acquiring Autotox. So Autotox is an Israeli chip maker. Um, it makes V to X sensors, so that's a vehicle to X is everything, sensors that help cars, micromobility devices, and other modes of transport communicate with each other to avoid collisions. Um, and uh, James, you want to guess how much it's acquiring Autotox for? Uh, $20 million. <laughs> no, $350 million to $400 million. So this Good. is almost a half a billion dollar deal, a uh, pretty big deal for Autosox, pretty big deal also for Qualcomm. Um, and the hope is that this deal is going to help beef up Snapdragon, which is Qualcomm's mobility tech portfolio. Um, I think this is also just an important signal that Qualcomm is seeing road safety as a lucrative opportunity. Um, and just generally that, you know, folks are taking V to X uh, maybe more seriously or as seriously uh, across different modes of transportation. So not just cars, but also micromobility devices and also, also other modes of transport. So James, now that you've got your, your hard hat on, what do you what do you think of this story? How, you know, what do you think of this acquisition? I love this story. I love this acquisition. I think uh, in many ways, you know, Julia, I know we talk a lot about uh, Southern California kind of being the Detroit of micromobility and, um, you know, I, and, and Ride One Up, who we'll have on today, is actually out of San Diego as well, although they, I think the, he's originally from Northern California via, uh, actually via uh, ne the Netherlands. Um, but this is just part of, this is a huge part of it. And I'm like so excited about this announcement. Uh, you know, Qualcomm is basically the intel of Southern California in many ways, the, you know, <laughs> this amazing chip company that could really revolutionize mobility. Um, and this is definitely one of my dreams um, that I think is the much more 
optimistic side of safety, which I feel like we often don't get to talk about because we talk about tragedy and, and, you know, politics and other things. Um, but I do really believe that a lot of what Qualcomm is working on with Snapdragon, a lot of what things like V2X represent is this future world where like our kids are going to be like, wait, you will like walk on a sidewalk and, uh, you know, like a car could just hit you. And there was like no way to basically stop that. Um, and there was no way to actually allow you to talk to that car and that car to understand who you are and where you are in relative motion. So that's like my, this is like one of my big dreams where there's like, I can't believe you would actually move around without more technology, without more of a sense of like, um, you know, these, these big machines not being able to, to run you over. Um, and so I think this is a very good move. I'm really happy. I, you know, I, I think the challenge, like one, it'd be great to have Qualcomm on the show, but also a big challenge to the other chip and chip companies and, um, you know, how are they getting involved? Cause it does seem like Qualcomm is starting to actually create quite an aggressive lead. Um, but it's just, I think it's better when there's more competition. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, first of all, I love this. Uh, SoCal is the Detroit of micro mobility. I, I don't know that you've said that before, James, but that is very quotable. So let's just let's just put a pin in that one. And then the other thing will come is the Intel of SoCal. I'm not sure if they would love that, but they might. Um, but the point that I was going to make actually about Qualcomm is maybe it's just a different type of business that's getting into VTX sensors. Because when I was at Siemens, for example, we had a lot of VTX technology. So this might just be an indicator that there's a different type of tech company who's going, you know, who's getting into V2X and is seeing the B2B, the business to business opportunity in terms of um, uh, beefing up their uh, mobility tech portfolio and starting to um, not just see auto manufacturers, but other, also other types of transport manufacturers as, as potential customers. So um, I think this valuation too of 350 to 400 million dollars is like to me, fascinating and also quite high. I, I actually don't know that much about auto techs, but, um, um, or auto talks rather, not auto techs, uh, but uh, 350 or $400 million, I mean, is a significant amount of money. So um, I guess the other question too is um, uh, where these chips are going to be manufactured and whether there's going to be some reshoring of this or whether um, it's going to continue to happen, happen wherever auto talks uh, actually manufactures their chips. So. I would say agree, big deal. Um, and I mean, of the acquisitions that we talk about, uh, this is one of the larger ones that we've we've discussed on the show. Yeah, and um, I, I think you know the, the the other call out from that press release was, um, I think Qualcomm and Snapdragon, you know, their pipeline right now of, of um, deals they've closed with auto manufacturers is like, I think it's like on a twelve or fourteen billion dollar run rate. Um, so this is a, a lot of what. Of course, come pay, you know, some of their biggest customers are like Volvo and such, um, where they know they want to use the the Snapdragon drivetrain technology and everything. But if you can layer on, of course, V2X into all of those deals, um, there's probably a pretty good bundling package there for, for Qualcomm. So it's, it is, it's big, big dollars. It's one of the only, it's one of the areas of micro mobility where I think it, it does allow us to talk about um, the interplay with, with cars specifically, I think is the most important thing. Um, and it allows, I think, a lot of our micro-mobility companies in our industry to swim up market a little bit and talk about, you know, like, because I think, you know, it, even Auto Talks did a lot of work specifically catering toward the bikes with the VTX. We can show some of the videos. Um, and so it's this, it's this cool area that I think we got to continue to talk about, Julia, where this, you know, we have to live in harmony with um, cars. They're not going away by any means. Um, and some of this stuff is super harmonious potentially to making, um, you know, micro-mobility a lot safer. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's big, big dollars here. And, um, I, I think it's just the start. Yeah. Um, and James, maybe before you get into launches of some of the vehicles, cause I know we have a bunch this, this week, I might go yeah. through another news story, um, and just take us to a different part of the planet, uh, to, to India. The second big news story is that India based hero Motocorp just launched Vita. Um, so Vita is its electric moped subsidiary, and it's going to be debuting the moped um, throughout Hero's network of dealerships in more than 100 cities across the country. So I think this is actually uh, just kind of amazing. I mean, first of all, that you know, Hero Motor Corp has 100 or, uh, dealerships in over 100 cities across the country. Um, it's uh, debuting its own electric moped, and it's starting to compete with um, the big uh, uh you know, competitor in India, Ola Electric. Um, and Ola Electric has continued to just show, I think everybody around the world, but especially in India, um, how much uh, electric bopeds are needed. So this past month, they had 
30,000 electric moped sale, sales. Um, and they're saying, Ola is saying that they're uh, controlling about 40% of the market share. So James, uh, I mean, I think we've, this has been sort of like a resounding theme throughout um, our time on the podcast, but just seeing what's happening in the two-wheeler and three-wheeler electric market uh, in India is kind of inspiring. I'm, I'm curious, what do you what do you think about uh, about um, uh, Ola now having a competitor? Yeah, I think it's I well, yeah, just like in the say with Qualcomm, I think it's really good to to see more entrants come in. Um, and yeah, this is like your wheel house, Julia. I think with all the things you're so intrigued by as it relates to two wheel, you know, electric vehicles and 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 just global global numbers. Um, so yeah, this is like your perfect story. Um, and yeah, it's astounding. Thirty thousand vehicles at about forty percent of the market share. So you figure, you know, they're doing, you know, India is probably doing seventy five thousand um, moped sales a month. Uh, that's just a really big number, right? So that's that's a that's a, you know a million a year easily on a, a million run rate uh, a year for you just think about Ola. That, like, for Ola, <laughs> right? Right. That's for and a then, single company. We're doing like a million mm-hmm. bikes a year. Uh, period, right? Right. And, you know, these are clean vehicles, right? This is much better. You're getting a lot of like really, probably poorly, uh, you know, equipped uh, get gas and diesel, but, you know, mopeds off the streets. So, um, yeah, it's really, it's a, it's a really great story. I think we have to continue to watch it. I think we'll have a little bit of this at Micro Mobility Europe, but, you know, we do need to, you know, hopefully get some of these founders on, those, on, the, on the, the show uh, to discuss this more. Yeah, and I think what would be uh, particularly interesting to talk with them about, I mean, there, there's so many things, right? But like both the upstream and the downstream, you know, Hero Motor Corp, Ola Electric, uh, just getting an understanding of how they're doing manufacturing supply chains within the, India itself. Um, and then for that matter, you know, what was fascinating to me too is we have so many of these um, electric bike companies or other types of uh, micro mobility companies in Europe and in uh, the US that are direct to consumer. You buy it online, it gets shipped to you. Um, but we're talking about a company that has a network of dealerships across a hundred cities or more than a hundred cities in India. So they already have that interface um, with the customer in a, you know, real live physical location. Um, so also interesting to figure out how that's going to affect uh, maintenance, um, how that's going to affect um, things like bot- battery swapping, how that's going to affect um, just the overall quality of the experience of the consumer in terms of, of buying and then using um, these vehicles. So maybe one other piece I'll, I'll add on to that story, James, and just to keep us in, in India for a minute is um, Zip Electric is uh, announcing plans to deploy more than 10,000 electric delivery mopeds in Bengaluru within the next two months. Um, that's a single city, 10,000 electric delivery mopeds in a single city within the next two months. Um, so I think you're you're really starting to see, you know, not just um, the broader adoption of electric mopeds uh, in India writ large and for a variety of uses, but then um, you're getting some companies who are really taking advantage of the fact that they are available for uh, purposes like, you know, delivery. Um, so, you know, again, I, I think just a lot of really interesting trends coming out of India. I agree. Um, so like just to, just to play a little bit on our past episodes, Julia. So what we heard out of Wiz in New York City was there's about 70,000 potential delivery um, uh, riders out there. Uh, Wiz, I think at the time when we talked to them, had a footprint of about 800 vehicles on the street. Um, so this is like an order of magnitude, right? Just like <laughs> you know. Know, one company in one city in India. Um, I, I'm not actually sure how big um, Bangalore is versus New York City, probably, probably more bigger population. But, you know, this is, we do need to see these types of, you know, efforts, yeah, I think, in in the U.S. You know, I think this would be a great program for New York City to study how ZIP is doing this. Um, you know, we, we do we do need this kind of scale. Like, there, you could easily drop 10,000 e-bikes um, through an incentive program to delivery riders in New York, and it would have a, it would have a profound impact, um, of course, on rider safety. And on um, you know like some of the some of the bigger challenges that New York is dealing with like like fires. So um, yeah, I love. I think we have to really like these, uh, and hopefully we can get more data. You know, it's always a little it's a little hard to get this data sometimes out of India. It'd be great if we had a little bit more of a first person experience. So maybe we got to go there, Julia. Or maybe we just have to do a better job. Trying maybe to get we got to go there. Show. Yeah, this is my yeah. whole pitch. Remember, I think I pitched you on like a docu series going to some of the different micro mobility capitals of the world. We go Absolutely. to Mexico City, we go Paris, we go, uh, well, actually, I don't know where we would go in India. It sounds like we'd have to do a multi-city tour. 
Um, yeah, we might we might even have to go to Denver. I'm like, what would you say is the micromobility capital of the U.S.? Is it L.A.? Do we get to be it, or is it New York? Yeah, one hundred percent. L.A. All right. Uh, I don't LA. know. You know, I have L.A. LA. is so sprawled, right? Southern California. Yeah, yeah. We'll just say uh, SoCal. So <laughs> SoCal, <laughs> the Detroit of micromobility, as one would say. I mean, let's just hope we don't end up like Detroit. But um, yeah, I think that's the that is, great. That You've is the doomed play. us. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. Shout out to Detroit. No, they're not. Yeah. No, they're not Detroit. <laughs> um, okay, let's do some launches, Julia. So uh, quite a few launches naturally uh, coming up again. Um, and uh, yeah, I want to get your feedback on some of these bikes uh, and other actually vehicles, not just e-bikes. Um, but the first is a Razor, which, you know, kind of think of Razor. Shout out to like the my kids kick scooters and what you know, is basically synonymous now with um, analog kick scooters. Um, they've come out now with a uh, moped style class two e-bike uh it's kind of got the fat tire focus they're calling it the razor rambler 20. um and probably the most indistinct thing about it and um you know it's not yeah i don't really think of the their acoustic scooters as being that cheap um but they're selling this at best buy for uh 999 dollars uh, so just a couple cool things there one you have this like you know brand that Julia, one of our themes has been like, how do you follow someone through their life, their lifestyle? We talked about that with Super 73. Um, in many ways, Razor has this great uh, customer adoption curve with younger people. If they can continue that up the chain. And then if you think about this price point at $9.99, you think about where they're selling it through, Best Buy, like you can kind of see like, oh, I wonder if this is just great, like kind of teenager, young adult play where maybe you still have your parents buying it for you or going to the store with you. Um, so I really like this from Razor in that, and potentially, I don't know if that's our customer strategy, but I was kind of thinking about it like that. Um, yeah. So, you know, Best Buy for less than a thousand dollars, you can pick up what is probably a very high quality e-bike. Um, any thoughts on that, Julia? Yeah. I mean, a couple of thoughts. Uh, actually, one of the reasons I, I don't really ride scooters is because of my brother's Razor scooter. So when, when he was little... I tried to ride my brother's Razor scooter, like took a, took a corner too, too fast totally wiped out ended up getting like really hurt um and then like have never actually recovered from it um but all jokes aside i think it's it's great that they um that they have launched an electric moped moped style e-bike um what strikes me about this story is actually the partnership that they have with best buy to sell it through best buy i'm fascinated to see like which e-bike companies are selling their um e-bikes through which um what's the opposite out of a mom and pop a big box like big box store so like Razor decided uh, Best Buy. Some other folks are selling through Walmart. Other folks are selling through, you know, Costco. At some point, somebody's going to sell through Target. Um, it's just, um, I think they're they're reaching out to different consumer bases. And so with um, this partnership with Best Buy, I think what um, uh, Razor is acknowledging partially is that they have a similar, you know, customer base to Best Buy, uh, but also that this is a this is a piece of tech that people are going to treat their e-bike. Um, in the same way that they might treat the purchase of a of a of a TV, so um, I'm just interested to see how that plays out. But yeah, I mean, I think the other thing you mentioned around um, uh, following the um, consumer from when they're younger and maybe have like nostalgia, you know, memories of Razor scooters, similar to how I did to to getting them when they're older, might have kids of their own, and uh, is interesting. I would also say that this is just like an opportunity to um, uh, uh, just you know, even people who don't know Razor scooters from before, um, just uh, kind of show them something that might be interesting to them when they're shopping at Best Buy uh, and 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 get to the customer in that way. Yeah, yeah, totally. So, okay, let's see what happens here, Razor. And um, hopefully if we're around a big box, Julia, we got to go check out the, <laughs> go check out in the store. Um, next up is Hay Bike, which, you know, been around and made some amazing bikes. They're out with the Ranger S, which again, has this style to it that I think is very common now. Um, and, you know, we're, we're in the process of reviewing the Abiton Cinch, which has a very similar look and feel. Um, and so, you know, just a, a really interesting bike, class three, up to 20 miles per hour, heavier bike um, at over 90 pounds, which is impressive. But again, I think it's going for this um, it's kind of bulky, heavy, fast, um, but also like low to the ground and, you know, kind of easy to ride. Um, so that bike's out. Um, I also wanted to give a shout out to not, not an e-bike, but to Wooling Bingo, um, who has a tiny car that's out. Um, this starts at $8,600 and comes at either 41 or 68 horsepower. Um, it has 126 or 200 miles of range. 
Uh, and probably the funniest thing about it is it comes with an inflatable mattress in the back. So, um, you know, you can really do whatever you want, I guess, in the willing, uh, bingo. And, uh, yeah, I mean, what do you think, Julia? 68, <laughs> 68 horsepower, inflatable mattress in the back. Is there like a, I don't know, is there a tie in there or, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know. You bought a car with an inflatable yeah. mattress in the back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I try not to. I mean, it's not like a selling, uh, like an extreme selling point to me. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I it, like it strikes me as kind of a weird choice. The only thing I can think of is like maybe this is meant to be like a road trip car. I can totally see somebody, especially when you look at the images of it. This is a car that you take along the Pacific Coast Highway, and you're just like, let me like post up and see the sunset, and just like be on my inflatable mattress in the back of my car. And can you imagine what a flex that is when you like post up next to somebody else, and you're just like, let me like get back into the bed that I have in the back of my vehicle, and it doesn't have to be like a, a sprinter van like you see, um, you know, so many other people drive. Like this is this is unique. Uh, so I don't know. I'm kind of down with it. Like, I think it's, I think it's really weird. Like I would not shop for a, a vehicle based on like whether or not it had an inflatable mattress in the back. I don't know. I don't know. It feels like you can get your own, but um, whatever. They're going for a, a certain vibe here and I'm here for it. If you're going along the PCH and this is about uh state the sunsets. Yeah, for sure. I think the only problem is that, you know, 68, 68 horsepower, we definitely have to slow down the speeds of the PCH. <laughs> Um, this is like your deep urban, uh, inflatable mattress car concept, I think, based on the, based on how fast you might be going in this thing. Wait, how um, fast do you think you can go at 68 horsepower? Is that like 30 miles an hour? What a shit, what is uh, that? Uh, yeah, that's not very fast. I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure, but yeah, I, I wouldn't, I don't think you're going faster than, than 35. At, I, I don't know what the weight is. Um, yeah, we can find I mean, that either out. that or like based on some of the staging of these photos too, it looks like maybe you like put your kids in the back and like you, you're taking your kids to school or something. I, I don't know. I, yeah. yeah. You're going to have to ask them. Like an yeah. NV with a mattress, right? Which yeah. again, I like that vibe. Um, just be careful what streets you're on with that thing. <laughs> um, all right, let's go to e-bike inception, which is turn is out with a kit that allows you to haul a bike behind their cargo bike. Um, which again is kind of really cool. This idea that you know, I I often will haul um, bikes in my my van um, when I go camping and things like that. Um, but do you can you ever think of a use case, Julia, where you need to haul the bike behind your bike? I mean, yeah. If one bike uh, breaks down, you're riding in pairs or with other people, and being able to haul the bike behind your bike, definitely. Um, I think the other thing might be if you want to start doing bike delivery by bike. Um, so instead of, you know, having somebody drop off a, a bike to your home with a car or van, you just um, bike it along. Or let's just say you don't have the parts that you need to do mobile bike maintenance, then you can grab the bike and bring it back um, to wherever the shop is. So those are some of the things I can think about. Would okay. I use it? No, probably not. But you know, okay. they're, they're they're just trying to trying to brainstorm here. That's fair. That's fair. Those are good brainstorms. Uh, let's go to Van Move. Um, so our folks out of out of Amsterdam, our friends who will see at Microbody Europe, they just released their S4 and X4. Um, I think the way you would think about this is a simpler, cheaper Van Move bike, which we haven't necessarily seen in the past. Generally, the bikes have gotten a little bit more complex and a little bit more expensive. Um, but this bike is retailing at uh, less than twenty five hundred dollars US, um, and so it's it's more affordable than their uh, five series vehicles, and it's also a two speed gear hub with an adaptive motor support, um, which again is slightly. I'm, I'm, I think the last um, motor hub was four speed, if I'm not mistaken. Mistaken, um, and then in sort of the classic Vanu style, though, uh, I think they've done a wonderful job from a product marketing perspective, and the new colors really look nice, like really they interesting. They look so and compelling. good. Yeah, they look like so a stunning good. color. So I, of course, want one of those in yellow. Um, what color <laughs> would you choose, Julia? I mean, uh, it's hard to argue with yellow just because of the micromobility colors, but I would honestly take one in any color. I, I think that they're really good looking. I actually love that Ben Move decided to lower the price point. I think it gets into this um, conversation we've been having, James, about how on the e-cargo bike uh, side in particular, we're seeing a sweet spot somewhere between $2,000 and $2,500 that... Um, Maybe it's a result of the supply cost coming down, but also just like the consumer wants to pay a little bit less. And so a band needs to get into that sweet spot um, and appeal to a slightly different consumer. 
Um, I actually also like, uh, not that you asked my opinion, but I'm going to give it anyways. I, I like that it's uh, gotten a little bit um, simpler. I think what it tends to happen with like the Van Moose, the Cowboys, sort of um, um, uh, uh, these really sleek, like beautiful iPhone like e-bikes is that maybe they are a bit complicated. And so you just want to like tone it down a notch. Um, make it a really fun color, make it a little bit more affordable and make it then therefore more accessible to a wider variety of, of people. So I'm super excited about this. I think it looks great. Um, I would honestly take any color because I, I just think, you know, having one of those lighter, um, just easier e-bikes in your uh, arsenal of e-bikes or in the e-bikes that you ride around town um, just is uh, not only a joy to ride, but also um uh, just a good way of attracting other people to e-bikes. Like people notice these bikes, uh, whereas some of the other e-bikes, you know, they notice them, but maybe not necessarily in the same, like, oh, that's really cool way. Yeah, I think those are all good points. So they move, ship out some vehicles this way. Let's let's test these out on the, the mean streets of California. Um, next up is Yamaha. And so here's a, here's a fun fact, Julia. Yamaha claims that they made the first electric assist bicycle in the early 90s. I did not know that. Um, but they're back now, and they've come out with two new um, e-bike models that they've shipped. One is the Booster e-bike with a top speed of 15 miles per hour. Again, so think about that that vehicle. It's a cool-looking vehicle, but it only goes 15, which, you know, I'm trying to think about, okay, who are they, who are they targeting that at? A 15, like, you know, that's basically that trike speed or kid speed. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm very intrigued by that. And then they have this, what they call their booster Pedelec, um, which is a top speed of 28, which is, of course, basically, you know, much quicker at that class three range of speed. Um, but they look, they look cool. I like to look, uh, I like to see Yamaha in the e-bike game as well. Um, and again, it seems like they have a lot of, a lot, I, I don't think about Yamaha in the e-bike game, um, but it sounds like they do have heritage here too in history. Um, so I'm, I'm excited about those vehicles. Uh, would you ever buy a vehicle that only went 15 miles per hour though? Not me. No, I wouldn't. It's too slow. I mean, it's it's too slow. Um, yeah. But what I will say is looking at the design of these bikes, I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of thinking that this is for teens. Like if I just see kind of how it's oriented, you could probably fit like three or four people on there. If you're if you're not doing it like legally or whatever, you can get maybe a couple people on the back, you can get one person on the seat and then get what get one person in the front. So I think this would be a super fun bike to have as a teenager just to be able to like you know ride around the neighborhood ride to school maybe give one of your friends uh, a ride to school um so that's kind of how i am envisioning it being used and the other maybe target demographic is folks who are a little older who don't necessarily want to go as fast um and who don't feel comfortable speeding along at 25 miles per hour or more um so yeah i i wouldn't buy a bike that uh, only goes 15 miles an hour but i i see a market for it yeah those are good thoughts i i agree with you so Yamaha, welcome back to the party, I think would be the, the best phrase for you. And we're excited to try out some of those vehicles. Uh, next up is out of uh, West Coast here, um, actually out in Oregon, Portland, V-Volt. I think that's how you say it, Julia. Would you would you correct me on that? V-V-O-L-T. Would you say V-Volt or would you say Volt? Like, how do you say I two Vs say... next to each other? <laughs> I've never thought about this question. Um the Volt. <laughs> the Volt. Okay. Yeah, that's the I, 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 I pronounced more direct. Um, doesn't matter. They're out with some killer looking vehicles, though. I really like so that this is, we'll have the Volt on the show next week. The founder, who's also the founder of a really interesting clothing company um, out of out of Oregon called, um, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting the name. Sorry. Um, but we'll talk about it next week. Uh, and now he's, he's, he's built this uh, e bike company. And so they've kind of um, uh, announced their first three lines. It's the Slice Light, the Pie, and the Slice DLX. Is this a pizza vibe? Yeah. <laughs> um, it feels like a pizza vibe thing to me. Um, and they're these beautiful uh, vehicles that we'll talk again more about next week. I think what I want to know most about is they have the mid-drive motor, but then they're claiming, it, especially on the cargo, is this this like sort of turbo accelerant off the start. So you don't have the challenge that you have often with mid-drive motors where it's that cold start when you have a lot of cargo and that really is uncomfortable if you're at a standstill. Um, so let's see what this uh, this turbo um, boost feels like uh, actually in action. So they'll be on next week. The video of it is is really cool. Like the colors as well. I think you really like the colors, Julia. And um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's another one again on the West Coast making some really cool stuff. And then finally, to kind of go back to the Wuling concept of, of riding, 
I also wanted to give a shout out to um, a Chinese vehicle manufacturer, MG Motor, and they've, they've announced their MG Comet, which is actually going to be built for India, uh, Julia, in that market. Okay. And um, they're trying to build it as kind of the cheapest electric car. Again, in our parlance, I feel like this is much more of a neighborhood electric vehicle, the size and the feeling of it, um, and sort of the range and the, the speeds. Um, but they're, you know, how, how they might, that might be very different in India. Um, so the Comet is going to come in around $10,000, which is uh, slightly more like than the Wuling that we talked about earlier. Um, it offers about 143 miles of range, which is, is a little bit more range than we talked about before. Um, so yeah, what do you think of this thing? Do you like it? Do you not like it? Um, I mean, to be honest, I want to see all of these, uh, I'll just say like out in the wild. Like it'd be great to see them on streets where they're designed for um, that environment. And the reason I say that is because with these neighborhood electric vehicles, when they're paired or next to, you know, cars and trucks in the U.S., they look they look really small. I mean, they it just like looks somewhat out of place. When you go to Amsterdam and you see the neighborhood electric vehicles, they look completely um, at home. And I'm sure the same is true uh, as they're launching these vehicles in, in India and China and in certain parts of India and China. And I would actually just love to see it because I think there's there is a use case for neighborhood electric vehicles. They offer so much in terms of weather protection. They offer um, more, you know, ability to get more people in them, cargo, um, et cetera. They're at a lower price point. Um, they, you know, I'm sure provide some air conditioning too uh, if you're in a place where it gets hot. So I'm, I'm pro them. I think I just would, it's almost like hard for me to envision um, how they would look out in the street and how, how normal they would look out in the street. Um, but certainly from a safety perspective too, just having neighborhood electric vehicles next to two and three wheelers um, is much better um, than uh, having, you know, a Ford F-150 uh, uh, next to two and three wheelers uh, on a street. Yeah. And then I also wanted to mention um, that we had the uh, the latest podcast, our micro mobility podcast from Oliver Bruce had on the founder of, um, um, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting the name now. Can you help me, Julia? No, <laughs> I have too many. I have too many things I'm trying to coordinate in my. Uh, well, hey Oliver, Julia doesn't listen to your podcast. Sorry, yeah, I know. Um, I was like, don't call me micro, out here. <laughs> micro Lino. Um, so, and his name is actually Oliver Obiter. Uh, and so he told the story on our latest podcast. So check out definitely you know go to Micro Lidio, check out our latest podcast because Julia clearly doesn't listen to it. So many <laughs> no. viewers, um, okay. but that thing is cool, Julia. I really like the Micro Lino. And um, I, have you seen the Micro Lino? No, I haven't. Okay, yeah, you got to check out the Micro Lino. Hopefully, we're going to be riding them in Amsterdam in a couple Fun. weeks. I, it's think? got the it's got the door that opens in the front. Um, it's just really like a clever concept and cool. That's and I cool. know that the story is also just beautiful and that's, it's been a struggle and they've been trying to get it up and um, it's now shipping. So um, yeah, that's a shout out to Mike Relino. That's uh we need, we need some of those out here in the U S as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so Julia, I'm excited that we have the co-founder of ride one up uh, Kevin Duger on the show today. Um, Kevin comes from, uh, from a bio perspective from Northern California, um, and in Davis, which again, for us, California feet folks, we know how cool of an area Davis has been for, you know, sort of innovative thoughts around, uh, cycling for a long time. Um, and as far as I understand, Kevin, you have quite a bit of background, um, uh, over there in Europe from, um, sort of a lot of inspiration via the Netherlands, which is also super, super cool. Um, so today let's talk really quickly about the Rift. And the new bike you have there and you know what it stands for and what you're trying to accomplish with the rift yeah the rift is kind of a start uh that the rift and our rev one our our moped bike are a start of us offering more of the bikes that uh, a lot of americans want to see um, and bringing our mindset and our democratization of pricing to e-bikes to the market so we as you notice probably us in the market compared to other e-bike companies other micro mobility companies we try to offer product first really product um value uh models so you know we we make and build and design our bikes around as much as we can get the consumer per you know per dollar um uh, as any other company out there um and especially any other American-based company that, you know, offers the level of support uh, and, and folks on the customer that, that we do. 
Uh, so that's what the the rift is for us. It's it's a new style. It's something different. It's actually pretty common or pretty. It's not too unique in the marketplace, uh, as it's you know there's a lot of kind of bat tire options, but we still brought more versatility, more functionality, we think, to it and a, and a massive amount of range. So it's something for a different type of buyer than we typically had. Um, it's a nice, safe, comfortable, large, you know, I'm not actually a fan of these bad tire models or bad tire bikes, but, you know, we can't only design bikes that I would like. So that's kind of, <laughs> so we have to kind of go with what uh, what, what a lot of other people would, would like. And, um, you know, it, we don't, expect it to be our biggest model but it is again it's something where we want to bring our vision of how we provide e-bikes to people to a larger audience to more types of buyers and then let's talk about your audience there kevin so i and let me compliment you on what i do see is you you are striving hard for you know trying to make the most affordable uh e-bike possible while also you know adding little features like the four piston hydraulic brakes where a lot of people i think get your um, at your price point are going with like two piston hydraulic brakes. So there's things you're doing that I think ho I'm hoping the customer will notice. Um, but with your customer, how much are you selling to the American audience versus international? And um, also let's just talk, we're, we're going to give away the Prodigy. So I'd love to talk uh, briefly about the Prodigy as well. Yeah, sounds good. So uh, we don't really sell internationally other than Canada. And that's maybe one or one to 3% of our sales. Um, the Prodigy is is that same that same sort of uh, thing and a value that I don't you you can't find anywhere else and something that other people are making it's a class three um, kind of high end build all around but especially with this German made motor and drive system that is reliable it is it is powerful it's quiet it's so it's extremely smooth if you've ridden these um, and and hopefully soon you'll get that the, the chance to if you haven't but. Uh, at a price of 20, uh, 23 95 or 22 95 depending on which model you get. And if you get any sales or anything, uh, it's, it is, uh, a fantastic bike It's a little bit more of a European design. Um, so sometimes, you know, it's a, it's more, if you look at the overall look of the XR, the ST that we have, um, it's more of a, a kind of sleek commuter that is less of uh, less aligned with the rift. In it's, big, it, it's in the complete opposite direction of that bike. Uh, but is it, like is I it fair to say that's the bike you would ride more? Th that is one that I would ride more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then Kevin, just, you know, last thing I want to ship it over to Julia, but like, so you, you come via Northern California Davis where I think you've been inspired by a lot. I'd love to understand a little bit more about your background with the Netherlands and then what, yeah. what brings you to San Diego? Weather, weather. And those be, uh, the that can't be but, the answer there's got to be something else too <laughs> no no the ocean the weather the lifestyle over here um I, it's, I had been in northern california for a long time um and davis is a great place where you know i grew up on a bike and didn't have to own a car or even when i did it was uh, a family car that i you know wouldn't would almost never drive um until i was 26 or so uh because you can get by in that in that town without a car um but yeah, I, um, I got, I got started with bikes, you know, we grew up on bikes, so that's how we got around. Um, we would go back to Holland every year, uh, where my family lived until they, the grandparents passed away. We'd go back every year, uh, since I was a, a little kid. So that was, uh, it was interesting. It's just seeing Denmark and Holland and how people get around and how they live and how they deal with the, the environment around them. It's just it changes your perspective on what's normal and what uh what what's uh, efficient fun like it, it makes people are happier it seems like or in in the community around them is better off there's less noise pollution there's less uh you know angst and road rage and issues and kids can get around safe safely there's there's all these things that are improved downstream that you don't realize when you don't have the whole town infrastructure and society planned around shuttling people in these three thousand pound vehicles and it's not something that we can shift too easily as americans because the planning is you know we built most of our towns post 1940 so they were all car centric designs so it's it's you know, you, we have greater distances between things. It's not easy to go, you know, you, you 
a, a lot of places you move to or you or you visit in the U.S. Um, I didn't bring myself water, so my mouth is getting dry. Sorry. <laughs> but a lot of places you move to and visit in the U.S., it's uh, it's so there. There are three lane roads, four lane roads. The speed limits are fifty miles an hour. It's really difficult to to bike. I mean, the biggest in inhibitor I think of micro mobility in most places is um, safety and and comfort. And really, it's just people don't feel comfortable getting on a bike in most neighborhoods and trying to go you know it's it's stressful because cars are flying by 50 or 60 miles an hour you you just can't do that e-bikes solve almost all problems other than that safety thing and, and that's where we need more work on our our planning and infrastructure and really a reason why i moved here to san diego is on in our beach communities um we can get by with just a bike we have the the option too, but if you go to a lot of communities, it's it's uh it's not possible even. Yep, agree with that. And as a fellow living in Encinitas, you know, I think that's our goal with these beach communities is to make them safe. And yeah, Kevin, you got a you got a fellow safety advocate. <laughs> I, know, I was so, going to say, James, when does the hard hat come back worry. out? You start talking <laughs> about safety, I get excited. Yeah, right, Kevin, Julia, don't... take us home. I was going to say, Kevin, please don't encourage him. This has been like the entire episode has been James in a fucking hard hat. Um, so, <laughs> so, Kevin, I, I just want to say I appreciate uh, the way that you started out this interview, which is talking about the democratization of the e-bike. Um, we actually haven't had a single founder who I think has, has said something like that. Um, so it's it's pretty cool just to hear you you know talk about the price point, getting value, but also um, figuring out how you can get additional customers. Maybe the one question I have for you is it sounds like, um, or, you know, it sounds like from your description of the, the various bikes that y'all are putting out there, that you're not necessarily looking for one customer who's going to own multiples of your bike, um, but rather for many customers or many different types of customers who are going to own just one of your bikes. So is that the strategy? Like, how are you all thinking about this? Do you want um, customers who have multiple uh, Ryan one up bikes? Or are you looking just to get the entire family or the entire friend group um, on on the bike? Both, both. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, I, I mean, there are, there are people actually that own our, uh, I've seen a number of customers who own ride one of bikes. And then we released our rev one, for example, which is uh, more of a motor motorcycle moped style uh, bike. And I've seen them with our standard bikes and the, the rev one, which are entirely different bikes. Um, and that's me as, as one of those people actually, uh, but they do have, uh, you know, they're different use cases, but totally, you know, you get the same result of getting around your area on a ultra vision, uh, lightweight compared to a car, at least vehicle. Um, and it's been fun, you know, I mean, the, the rev is a ton of fun, more fun than I thought it would be, um, when we were working on that project. Uh, but, but yeah, um, we don't really. You know, we don't want to limit ourselves. We really want to, like I said, kind of bring our vision of our, our model of how we provide and build products to more of a, a larger variety of products. And you That's great. Yeah. yeah. And Kevin, I mean, I would hope that you would ride your own bikes. So I'm glad to hear that you own some of your own bikes uh, and mopeds for that matter. But um, maybe one other question for me, and then I'll turn it back over to James, is if you were going to buy a bike that wasn't your own, which which bike are you looking at? Or which moped? Like, which micromobility vehicle? Um, uh, Canyon, probably their Grail is really nice. That's something I've liked, yeah. I would. I mean, more as like, um, the one area we're not in is kind of higher-end recreational e-bikes. Hmm. The Canyon Grail. Okay, good to know. Yeah, they're, they're, we don't, you know, yeah, we haven't gotten there yet. These are bikes that, you know, we don't have any, we don't have any really good um, electric mountain bikes, for example. I mean, we Very have cool. our, our Prodigy XC, which is the trail bike, but it's not going to, it's not going to take you on, on downhill, you know, kind of hardcore mountain bike riding. Well, Kevin, That's I'm next. guessing Canyon has a, and a, has a lot of uh, envy for how quickly you've grown and that, you know, how you're at the size of the market you're going after. So it's nice, nice for you to shout them out. But I also think they'd be pretty yep. impressed with, with what we've seen from you guys and the traction that you have. 
Um, so, hey, thanks for coming on. Thanks for being the first guest to ever dial in from a phone. With, and not, actually, it doesn't look that bad. <laughs> the so, computer you know, was not shows working you get things done. <laughs> yeah, no, you, you made it. And um, we'll have you back on. And, um, yeah, congrats on all the success with the Ride One Up. And we you know look forward to continuing to follow along on your journey. Thank you. Thanks, James. Thanks, Julian. Okay. All right. Have a good one. See you. Thanks. Julia, we got to wrap up. That's it. Okay, make sure you don't have that. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, good luck with the race. Can't bring that with me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Julia, I'm riding on to Utah. I'll report in next week. We'll be back next week with Vivolt. It's going to be, I'm really excited to talk about their vehicles and what they've got going on in that founder story. Um, and yeah, anything else from you? Nope. We'll see you next week. Right on, James. Okay. Right on, okay. Julia. <laughs> see you. Bye.